me and Debbie to this program. Um, we always like to come before to this community and uh, try to get information and share information. Uh, we think that a major part of uh, the VCF uh, is to communicate with uh, the affected communities. We have many outreach programs uh, that we're going to talk about. So uh, I know this has been a, a difficult time for lots of people. And I want to thank John Field for, and his foundation for all of their support. And John has really been an important part of this community. And this bill, the Cedrova bill, would not be here except for John and the work of so many others in this room. Uh, and we owe them a great day. John, thank you so much. Line, and that was really the 
beginning of the victim's compensation. So I think when you look at what we've accomplished, you have to look at that as the starting date, October 3rd. And at that point, we, I think, had a pretty robust website, but our website is a lot more robust today. I think it's a really easy to navigate website, and we've done everything in our power to make it as user-friendly as possible. Uh, and the first thing that went on the website was the ability for you all, your lawyers here, for you and your clients, if you're not a good lawyer, or any person who wanted to make an application, to register. You could fill out a registration form. Now that was the first step. And the application is really in three pieces. There's a registration piece in which you can register, give us certain basic information. And then you're in our database. And we can communicate with you, and we're gathering up that information. And Debbie's going to give you a snapshot of who the applicants are at this particular point in time. And that changes daily. It's just a snapshot from time. And that was in October. And we also had our FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions. That's grown. It's very robust. And we have to thank the lawyers who have worked with us so diligently to raise issues, to raise issues that we needed to respond to. And you can look at our website and you can see there are new Frequently Asked Questions all the time. Because we're learning. We want to make things clear to everybody else. And what we have done is update those FAQs as we need. And we also set up a helpline. And I think our helpline has done an incredible job. Uh, it's open five days a week, I think from 8.30 to 5. Uh, the people speak Spanish on it. If there are Spanish-speaking people, we can respond to them in Spanish as well. And the helpline is a direct line for people to get uh, information, to get help with their application, and at least, I think we're doing a great job because we have very few complaints. And the complaints that we get, we act on immediately. So if for some reason you're not getting the right attention from our helpline, just send me a note. We'll get it corrected. If there shouldn't be a problem, we don't want any problems. We, you're our constituents, and we want to be able to communicate with you in every way possible. Now this is an online registration. Why did we do it this way? Well, we're in the 21st century, and this is very different than 10 years ago when the Victims' Compensation Fund started and everything was in paper. And it made the process that much longer and harder to do it in paper. Now we felt that most people can use computers, everybody is online, so we have an online application. But if you can't, Call the helpline. You can get a paper application. We'll take your paper application, and we'll, we we'll, we ourselves will make it online. But you can start easier. And if you go to our website, you'll see a video on our website, a step-by-step -step video that will take you through every part of the application. It's not easy, but it's not meant to be easy. We have and obligations. There's a statute that requires certain provisions for people to be eligible. We have to follow those provisions. And more so, we're dealing here with a fixed fund. We don't have, like the first victim's compensation fund, just all the money that we need. Although John and all those other folks did a great job, Congress provided $2,775,000,000. Now that sounds like a whole lot of money, and it is. But we only get a small part of that money for the first five years. And that means that we, and out of that money comes all our administrative expenses. So there is a tension, and we're always looking for not to do anything that's more expensive when we can do it administratively less expensive. Because every dime we take for administration means there's a dime less for the victims. And so, but at the same time, we want to do it as quickly as you want to do it. And I tell
takes people and effort to get it done. So there's a fine balance between having enough people to do the work, but not having too many that people are sitting idly by at any particular point in time. So we want to make sure as much of the money as possible goes to the victims that we have. So we only have $875 million to distribute in the first five years. And that's, a, that's, that's an awesome task. How do we do that? And we do that by trying to figure out, and we want everybody to get a award in the first five years. They want everybody to get something. Because in the fifth year, the fund ends, and in the sixth year, the rest of the money comes in. So we're going to know maybe two years, three years out, exactly, not exactly, but we'll know a lot more about how many claimants we're going to have. But we don't want anybody to get an award, at least enough to get a program share of the amount of money that's available in the first five years. And if we guess wrong, we're going to make a second payment in the fifth year, and then there'll be a third payment or a second payment, depending on how it all works, in the sixth year. Now, that's what Congress gave us. We have to deal within the confines of the budget that was provided by Congress, which does affect the outcome of what everyone is going to get and how they're going to get. So, uh, and let me just go back to this timeline for a minute. Uh, on October 31st, the eligibility form went online, and on December 5th, the compensation form went online. So you can see this just a really very short time uh, from the time uh, that we were up and running uh, and the time and where we are today. And what we've done during that time also is an elaborate outreach program that we're going to talk about with you today. So what I'd like to do is, before we go any further, is have Debbie give you some idea of some of the issues that we've dealt with, uh, some of the issues that have been of concern to us. Before I do that, Debbie, let me just say one thing, because I know everybody is interested in the issue of cancer and how it's going to work. And all I can tell you in starting out is we've said, and we will continue to say, and we will do what we've said we're going to do, that when NIOSH chance a new injury, including the cancers that NIOSH is going to have, we will have those injuries, they will become World Trade Center injuries, that they will be compensation. And whatever standards NIOSH is going to provide, we are going to follow. There may be some additional requirements that you have to meet under our statute as to area, geographic area that you are in, and time periods that you are there. But otherwise, there will be compensation for those injuries as well as treatment. So, with that said, uh, Debbie is going to uh, give you some more information and then uh, we'll come back. how these claims are received and reviewed and evaluated, and also some of the issues that we've confronted. Uh, and I want to um, uh, echo what, to start out with what Sheila said about the, the FAQs. These are frequently asked questions. They provide guidance uh, in, in these FAQs. We change them, we add to them, we supplement them regularly and why are we doing that we're doing that because we confront issues we as we become aware of issues that people are facing we then need to address that problem and we need to post guidance for people so we've been working consistently to respond to things that people have raised to our attention um, and that comes through also in the steps and the procedures that we're using to evaluate the claims um, so let me quickly run through the steps and then give you some information about where we stand. Um, 
The very first step in the process, as you mentioned, is to register. That's if you're filing an online claim. Um, and we did this online process because it will save us on administrative expenses. And that's the purpose of doing this. We thought it would be easier for some people and it will save us some cost, and that's important. Um, so you register, you create an account. You can't file online, you call and you request a paper form. Now, the next step in the process is to fill out an eligibility form. That's, a, that's if you're not eligible, you weren't at the location at, during the time frame prescribed by Congress, then you're not going to be eligible for the program. So we need to make sure that we've got the right population. We can't afford to spend money on people who aren't in the eligible population. So our first step is to determine whether people are eligible. Um, then uh, you've made a compensation form available as you're eligible. You then proceed to the compensation form. Those are the three basic steps. Now, on, uh, I want to speak a little bit about eligibility because um, we've adjusted our procedures a bit in response to uh, things that we're seeing, questions that have been raised, issues that people have, um, have noted for us. So some people have indicated that they have some difficulty getting a hold of medical records, or it's time consuming, but it's expensive. So we have uh, worked with the NIOSH program to, um, to get information directly from that program about people's certified conditions. Those are the triggers, those are the conditions that are eligible for compensation under the DCF. So we posted guidance that says, you really don't need to go get those records right now because we can go directly to the NIOSH program and we can find out what your certified conditions are. So we can save you that burden. You don't need to do it. Now, there may come a time when we need some records. There may be, uh, it may be that you're not part of the NIOSH treatment program and we need to go a different route. But at least for those people who are being treated, we don't need you to run out and get records and we don't need to put that burden on you. Another issue is, can you demonstrate that you were present at the site? We've been working with employers, we've been working with the fire department, the police department, other entities in the city of New York. We've been working also with, um, as I said, major employers in the area and even landlord um, rental agencies and rental entities in the area to help us confirm um, without, again, putting a burden on the claimant, whether somebody was present at the site. We actually have developed some direct communications. And again, our goal is to save the time and the expense and the difficulty to make the process run simpler for people. Um, so we continue to work on those things so that we can, again, streamline this and make sure that people don't get overburdened by uh, attempting to gather documents. Um, let me tell you a little bit, um, Sheila said, let's talk about where, a snapshot of where we are. Um, we have, as, as uh, Sheila discussed, we have, uh, we've had these uh, uh, application forms available now for, uh, well, it's coming about a year for the eligibility form, I guess, you know, a couple of months before. Um, and, uh, and, and we've had the registration system up for longer than that. We have um, total submitted registrations. Um, a, a pro it's approximately um, 10,000 submitted registrations. These are just the registrations themselves. It has nothing to do with whether the person has gone ahead and filed a form. Um, the majority of the registrants, the, the information that we have, and this is based on what people say when they submit the material. This is not uh, confirmed or anything. This is basically what people say. Uh, most people fall into the responder category, um, but we do have a fairly substantial number of people in different categories, including non-responder, cleanup activities, um, we have some people from the Pentagon and the Shanksville site as well, a small number of people. So we have a pretty good cross section, we think, at this point of people who started the process of participating in the program. We have about 1,400 people who had a claim in the first Victims' Compensation Fund who have also submitted registrations here. So some people have come back 
to amend their claim and I, I'm assuming because we've looked at a few of them in more depth to indicate that their condition has gotten worse since the first victim's compensation fund and now they should have a basis for uh, a different or more compensation. Um, we have, now we get to the eligibility process. So this is where we, we start having something to look at. This is where we can start reviewing a claim. And I should just note that we do not start reviewing a claim until we receive the written authorization forms that are at the end of the application form. These are the signatures that we need to have that allow us to communicate with third parties, and there are the attestations that uh, you know confirm the information in the form. We actually do not put a claim into the review process until we receive those. So it's very important to get those in quickly. We've been contacting some people and asking them to hurry up and get their forms in so we can move them through the process. So don't forget that, that part of the process. So we don't allow somebody to go into that process till we have what we call the wet signature, the actual written form that has to be mailed in. We have about, um, as this is as of Friday, 587 submitted eligibility forms. So these are forms that are actually where somebody has clicked the button online to say submit. And that's how many have come in. And of those, we have found that uh, we have about 278 that have enough and the signed form so that we can move them into the review process. The first step in the review process is to go to NIOSH to determine whether we have certified conditions among these claimants. And so this information has been being exchanged. We have worked out an arrangement with the NIOSH program. We post uh, information so that they can respond to us and give us the details. So they give us the, what the, the actual condition, the name of the condition and the, the code, which if you're familiar with this, it's an ICD-9 code, which is the medical jargon that's used to describe the particular condition. So we have been um, working with the NIOSH program to make sure that we have that information and that at that point, the claim goes through the next step in the review process. So we have uh, active uh, under review we have, um, we have um, as I said, we have slightly under 300 claims in somewhere in the process. Some of them are on hold waiting for additional information. Some of them have, are moving through the process. Some of them have received their eligibility determination letters and are moving on to the compensation process. And I'll take a minute to talk about that. We have, about 36 compensation forms that have been submitted. Um, and of those, um, my understanding is from checking on this this morning, is that we only have uh, of those about seven that have gone through the eligibility process. So we have, so people are taking their time, they're, you know, they're, they're looking at the program, they're pulling together their information. Um, they have, obviously we have until, we have another year it's October of 2013 before they have a deadline for those people who knew of an injury or condition before the program started. Um, so they've got time to go ahead and continue to submit these materials. But we have a very small number at the moment. And what's been extremely valuable to us is the interaction that we've had with claimants. We've had through the outreach programs that I think she will talk about in a moment, um, through conversations with the lawyers, and just through direct conversations with claimants who call up um, to understand what questions and what issues they have. We do spend time speaking to individuals. We reach out when we see something on a claim form that we don't understand. We've been calling and asking for clarification so that we can provide guidance. Sometimes people have questions about something on the claim form they don't understand. That's why we have the helpline. We've been trying to make sure that we guide people so that they go the right direction and they don't spend time uh, on something that's not going to be helpful. So this interaction has been really, I think for, from our perspective, quite valuable because it allows us to put, post more guidance on the website, hopefully questions that, you know, when we see a question, we think that you're not the only person who has that question, we may as well post it so that others can see um, the response. 
So um, that's, a, I, I want to say one last thing about the issue of the, uh, if the NIOSH rule and if there's, you know, whatever is changed as a result of that rule, it will require us to make some changes in our claim form so that we can collect the right information. That's not going to delay anything else. But if there are people who want to make a claim based on a, a new condition in, that is um, contained in, in the NIOSH rule, it probably isn't going to happen immediately. They could always write something down on their claim form, but um, it will take, as I understand it, a little bit of time for NIOSH to implement that, whatever it is that they do. But we will have to make an adjustment to our form for that. I'll let you go back to... Uh, Thank you, Debbie. Yeah. Uh, you can see that this is a process that is going to take some time. And people who are impatient and want to know why payments haven't been made. You can see we have very few applications that we could make, even, even review, much less make payments. And the fact is that over 80% of the clients are also have lawyers who are who have registered from our registration. Now the lawyers are doing what good lawyers are doing. They're gathering up their documents, they're gathering up their information. And we know we're going to get inundated in fairly short order from a lot of clients. But we're grateful actually that I've had the time to be able to see how it's going to work out, be able to take the time with the you know, applications we have to be able to set up our processes in a way that hopefully when the bulk of claims start coming in, we'll be in a position to be able to do it pretty quickly. So uh, uh, let me just talk a couple of minutes about our outreach programs. Uh, many, many of you know uh, we have had pro bono clinics and the city of our justice system, which have been very successful. People register for them. They get pro bono help from lawyers in filling out their forms. We've had an enormous cooperation from the law schools and the students who have also acted in a pro bono way with lawyers supervising them, filling out forms. We have reached into the unions. We're doing a, a training program for DC 37 members. We're available to come and do it for any unions or any large group of people who want us to explain to their constituents how to fill out these forms. So we have this very robust outreach program uh, to help people in any way they can to get these forms to us and get them filled out. Now let me talk a minute about uh, the, and when are awards, people keep asking, when are you going to start paying money? We're going to start paying money as soon as we can and as soon as we can get enough of these through the system and people need to provide us with the information we need. If you look at our website, we have a part of the website that says, remember, we need this information. Please, don't send in the forms without the following information. So, as Debbie said, we have an outreach program with the claimants to get the information that we need. Now, it was also important, when cancer gets added, we have to figure out what the amount of people are going to be applying and what their awards are likely to be. So we know how much money we can give out in the first five years so that each award is going to have a pro rata share that they're going to get in the first five years. And we don't want the people in the fourth year not to get anything because we made the wrong estimate about how much people are going to get. So. In the next couple of weeks, you're going to see some announcements from us that are going to talk about that issue and going to talk about the process for getting applications for cancer. And just watch our website. It'll get on the website, and I'm sure it'll be picked up by uh, news media as well as to how we're going to handle uh, the NIOSH announcement when it comes. And we're going to try to implement uh, our systems as quickly as possible uh, after we find out what the final rule is. So uh, we need your cooperation, we need your help. 
People have been terrific in this community. Uh, we've been very grateful for the attention and help we've had. And we really look forward uh, to getting our eligibility uh, awards out, getting our, our compensation awards out, and uh, we're going to be trying to set up with lawyers a meeting very soon to try to give you as much guidance as we can based on what we've been learning from what's been included and not included in these applications. So again, it's been a great honor. We're here to answer as many of your questions as you have.